Uh, here, here I am. <laughs> no, I'm right here. So hopefully you all can hear me. Uh, great. All right. Um, we're going to present this uh, concept clearance for the whole chip toward more comprehensive analysis of genome-wide association data. And uh, many thanks to my colleague uh, Anastasia Weiss, who's only been with us for about six months, but has really uh, dived into this uh, this effort uh, with us. So that's great. Uh, we've gotten a little ribbing about the name of this. Uh, it might remind you of uh, Dorito or something like that. You might be aware that Doritos have lots and lots of components in them, and if you leave out even a couple of them, you just don't get the whole bang for your uh, your buck. So uh, similarly, uh, like genome-wide uh, arrays, what we'd like to do is support broader utilization of the data that are, are have already been generated in genome-wide studies of human disease. Um, the goals then would be for underutilized information, and we'll show you some data on how underutilized those may be. Um, uh, primarily the X that is, but also the Y, the mitochondrial and, and CNB data. Uh, we'd like to facilitate more comprehensive analysis of existing data uh, where necessary, uh, stimulate development and validation of new quality control uh, and genotype calling procedures, and also where necessary, develop and validate new statistical methods, analytic strategies, and study designs. Uh, some of you may be familiar with this, uh, this diagram. I understand there was a, a drinking game at the latest uh, ASHG where every time you saw this diagram shown, people took a drink. Uh, but at any rate, um, you notice that it's, it's very heavily populated everywhere except in the poor X chromosome. Well, actually, there's also this little guy that doesn't get any at all. Um, but quite a, quite a difference when one compares the, the, two, uh, the, chrom the uh, sex chromosomes to the autosomes. And Anastasia with uh, Lynn G, who's busily taking notes for, for counsel over there, reviewed actually nearly 400 of the most recent genome-wide association papers in the, in the uh, GWA catalog uh, from January of 2010 to March of 2011. And what you can see here is, is the proportion of papers. This is the number of papers per month. And then the proportion of them that, that even analyzed the X chromosome, whether or not they found anything, whether they reported analyzing it. Uh, and overall, it's only about 32% of the papers, about a third. Uh, and that did not change really over time. So it didn't increase or, or decrease uh, with time. We're not quite sure what happened in February of 2010. It just seemed to be a, a bit of an outlier. Uh, and if one looks at the uh, number of hits that have been found at the 5 times 10 to the minus 8th level in the catalog, uh, for chromosomes of similar size, there are about 50 hits. Uh, chromosomes, even the little teeny tiny ones, uh, have maybe a quarter to, uh, to half that many. And the X chromosome uh, has only seven um, of, uh, of 1,212 total, total associations at this level. So, so quite a difference there. Um, this is kind of a, an interesting uh, uh, thing to look at. Uh, Anastasia pulled out a, a nice example of uh, a data on dbGaP. You may be aware that the dbGaP staff uh, uh, do generate what are called pre-computes, where they basically take all of the uh, genotype data and, and relate it to the phenotype. The phenotype in this case was diabetic nephropathy. And they found an association on the X chromosome, the strongest association in the data set at 5 times 10 to the minus 11th. Um, when the, the paper was published, however, that uh, the X chromosome was not analyzed at all, and that hit went away, uh, they basically removed the X chromosome as the first step of QC without giving any reasons as to why they did that. Uh, this is kind of an interesting region. The SNP that's involved, uh, RS798159, is very near um, an ENCODE-defined uh, region of, of promoter-associated uh, histone marks. So many thanks to our ENCODE colleagues for generating these data. Um, and as you can see here, just kind of spreading this out a, a little bit, it really is uh, kind of right on the, on the, uh, the edge of the beginning of this, uh, this promoter-associated region. Uh, there's also what might be a little bit of DNA's hypersensitivity activity there as, as well. So sort of an interesting uh, SNP to, to look at and one that might have been uh, worth looking at uh, in, in this analysis. You'll notice that there are lots and lots of, of genes in this area, but uh, sort of upstream here, there's one that's a particularly attractive biologic uh, uh, candidate. The angiotensin converting enzyme 2 gene, which is uh, known to be associated with a whole variety of nephropathy related traits, including um, estimated uh, glomerular filtration rate, which is the definition of, of nephropathy. So that's not saying that, uh, that this is necessarily a, a causal association that, that uh, you know, could have been picked up with this, uh, this particular analysis, but it does kind of raise some questions as to why exclude the X outright. There may be some interesting stuff there. So um, there are reasons that the X chromosome is a little more difficult to analyze. There is somewhat lower genotyping accuracy due to difficulties with clustering algorithms that have to deal with the, the poor hemizygous genomically deficient among us, um, as well as the pseudoautosomal region shared with the X chromosome, with the Y chromosome that can be difficult to genotype. 
there's also more missing data. Um, 13 of 14 Geneva studies showed more individuals with a greater than 5% missing call rate. Uh, Geneva, of course, is our, our large-scale consortium of genome-wide studies in a, in a whole variety of, uh, of different traits, but uh, all analyzed out of, the, or at least the, the data are cleaned in the same coordinating center. And higher levels of chromosomal an anomalies, as shown here, uh, missing call rates for the autosomes were about 0.08% uh, or so. Uh, for the X chromosome, um, they're, they're about uh, uh, seven times more than that. For the Y chromosome, about 20 times more than that, so really quite a difference, but this is the one that we're focusing on. Mitochondrial also uh, uh, quite a bit more. In the autosomes, about 0.015% uh, percent, um, uh, noted anomalies. The X chromosome has about 10 times that, and the, and the Y chromosome a little bit less. So, so there are, you know, more challenges there. Still, we're talking about very low numbers of, of uh, SNP calls lost in, in percentages. Other reasons are that this is a little bit challenging to interpret. One does have to, to consider X inactivation. If you have a, a SNP that you've picked up, is it, is it on the active chromosome or isn't it? Plus, about 15% of all X chromosome genes escape inactivation, and that's not random. Obviously, there, there are uh, reasons for that happening. Analytically, this is a challenge. There was a, a lack of imputation software until relatively recently. Uh, there's some difficulty in assigning haplotypes, and uh, there's a need to accommodate different expectations for Hardy-Weinberg equilibrium and, and minor allele frequency estimation. It's not hard, it just has to be done a little bit differently from the autosomes. We did sort of an informal poll asking um, uh, folks that we knew that had collaborated with us on a variety of programs uh, why they thought this might be and, and whether it would be worth stimulating. There were some who felt that, that we really didn't need to stimulate, that it will happen naturally now that amputation programs uh, regularly include the X chromosome. There were others that felt that, that, uh, that we were really too early in trying to do this, that uh, the X chromosome was so difficult to genotype that, that really we had to wait until sequencing was better able to, uh, uh, to uh, approach those. Um, or maybe this is the right time. Um, it's clear that the first uh, genome-wide association papers really kind of set a precedent of excluding the X, and that hasn't seemed to be questioned to a great deal uh, beyond that. The autosomes provide so much data, perhaps you don't need to bother with the X, and you get around to it when you have time and you never have time. Uh, clustering algorithms, as I mentioned, are more complex, and there's a little more effort required to analyze them. There's also somewhat lower power with uh, uh, 3N versus uh, 4N genotypes in, uh, in these. So, in males, and, uh, males and females combined. So we're proposing uh, that we try to stimulate this area somewhat by uh, asking investigators to obtain and analyze existing genome-wide association data. It could be their own or data from dbGaP um, or other similar data sets. For phenotype associations with X chromosome variants primarily, we also would, would like to see how, how folks uh, might deal with Y chromosome mitochondrial variants and possibly uh, uh, structural variants as well. Uh, focus on data sets where these data have not really been analyzed, although one might allow them to do some replications using different methods. And develop and validate and, and disseminate possibly uh, new user-friendly quality control and analytic methods, um, again, with an open access model. Um, and we would, as is always our, our mandate in population genomics, uh, try to be sure that they include diverse populations, since those would be an issue as well. Uh, we would propose that investigators meet initially to share proposed methods, identify common analyses to be undertaken, uh, and then meet again halfway through to sort of assess progress, see how things are going. And then at the end, have a workshop that would be open to uh, uh, folks outside of the, of the investigator group uh, to report on experiences and explore and disseminate lessons learned. Um, again, we would, we would ask for a plan to analyze underutilized genome-wide data within this two-year time frame, uh, asking them to focus on the X chromosome. They would have to have access to existing data. Um, we would propose that perhaps about 10 percent of the budget be set aside, if needed, for genotyping and or sequencing of DNA in, in possibly a limited, high-priority subset of, of subjects. Uh, that's something that, that we could use your advice on. It might be worthwhile, um, but it would be something that, that we would hold in, in sort of reserve until we saw what kinds of applications we had come in. Uh, we would require deposition of individual level data in dbGaP if they were not read, already deposited. Uh, we would propose that simulation studies be allowed as, as part of methods development, but that uh, an application not be limited to simulation studies. There would need to be uh, analysis of existing data. Uh, suggested criteria for selection would include a broad range of diseases and traits. Um, as always in population genomics, high public health significance and ethnic diversity of the populations, uh, development, dissemination of uh, new methods, and uh, as a sort of a guideline, uh, at least 2,000 participants with existing high-quality uh, genome-wide chip data with greater than uh, 550,000 variants, and the more data that, uh, that can be provided, the better. 
We would anticipate funding this at a, at a relatively modest level, two to three million dollars total over a two-year period, so about 1.2 to 1.5 per year um, for four to eight awards. Um, we would propose the research project grant mechanism. We don't see that there is a need for a cooperative agreement approach, though we would, would uh, uh, look for your advice on that. And we would encourage participation of other institutes and centers to fund more applications with a wider range, wider range of phenotypes that might be relevant. Um, so we see this as, a, as an opportunity for maximizing the knowledge to be gained from existing genome-wide data, which, for which the research community has, has paid dearly, uh, to avoid missing important associations with human disease and to leverage available data with a modest additional cost. So I think with that, I'll uh, stop and ask for any comments. Mike. Thanks, Terry. Um, I'll focus my comments on the X chromosome because that was the primary focus of, of, of the concept clearance. Um, I totally agree that ignoring the X chromosome has really been uh, an issue over the last four or five years of, of GWAS. And um, I, I agree with Terry that basically the first few studies sort of set a precedent and guilty um, since, since mine was one of them for type 2 diabetes in 2007. Now, the reason that we were guilty is that it was actually three studies that were working together very closely. In fact, we ended up publishing papers back to back to back in science. Uh, two of the groups uh, had done the AFI 500K chip. We'd done the Illumina uh, 317K. And basically, we were in the early days of doing this, um, trying to decide how could we combine our data. Because you know, despite the large numbers of SNPs, there's only about 40,000 of them in common. And the happy fact is, at that same time, uh, Gonzalo Abacassis at our place and Jonathan Marchini in the UK were developing methods of genotype imputation. And so those methods were developed just in time that we could, in fact, impute genotypes uh, across our platforms in those early publications. They did, however, at that time only do it for the autosomes. It was only a couple of years later that that became uh, available for the X, which is at one level a little bit silly because the X is actually easier than the autosomes. Um, but uh, and, and the notion that haplotyping is harder for X chromosome than autosomes, well, we can't really credit that because you know a lot of the work is already done in the context of at least half the people. Um, but but I think that I think those early studies did set a precedent, and I think people have sort of been comfortable not dealing with the X chromosome, um, partly because of issues of you know how do you count? Uh, do you count females as having two and males as one, or with X in activation? Do you count one each, or how do you do that? There were early on issues of uh, availability for. Uh, of methods for, for testing, not methods really, but software. But, but those issues have really gone away. And, and I think over the last couple of years, the last year and a half really, imputation and analysis methods have now become available. Um, a lot of the work in GWAS, though, at this stage is focused on large-scale consortia, meta-analysis consortia. And those are not little PT cruisers. Those are, those are battleships that getting them to do something different takes some time. And so in the stuff that's been published in the last year and a half, um, the analysis, I think, is totally right. There's still this autosome bias. But if we look at what's going on right now, and I have to confess I'm not uh, able to look at everything that's going on right now, but if I look at type 2 diabetes and type 1 diabetes, other autoimmune diseases, lipids, blood pressure, glucose, um, anthropometrics, all of the sort of GWAS meta-analysis consortia that I'm involved in or have close contact with, all of those are now doing the X chromosome as part of the sort of current stage of analysis. Now, that's not saying that that's true for cancer or mental health. I'm, I'm not in touch with those communities. Um, I actually sent out some emails uh, last night to see if I could get some input. Um, and I suspect I have some input, but I can't get on the internet. <laughs> So, so I can't I can't go beyond the earliest returns I got, which were actually reasonably positive. Two, two like the idea of this this uh, sort this sort of idea of of encouraging the X. Two said, yeah, it's really not necessary. Um, so I, I see no harm in this, um, but I'm not sure I'm not sure all of this isn't going to happen just sort of naturally. If we were in a climate of lots of funding, I'd say by all means, let's go ahead and do this. Given that we're not, you know, I have I've sort of mixed emotions about going forward with, with something like this. I would say, in its defense, it is very little money. And so you know, w w one could. An alternate approach, I guess, would be to write sort of a brief position paper, uh, see if we could get it in a good journal, and say, you know, this is something people really ought to be doing, because now it's possible. Could you maybe talk about um, 
how applicable, because you talked about the X, but you also talked about CNVs and some of the other um, ways of doing analysis that have also been underrepresented. Um, maybe given some of this, if the focus, if X is being taken care of, you could still move ahead with this, but refocus it on some of these other types of analysis. Well, I think that's a, that's a good point. I. I, I think we we do need to look carefully at whether X is being taken care of, and and I think that you know the data that we have to date don't look all that great. I mean things really haven't changed much at least to, to March of 2011, and and these methods have been available since about 2009 or so, but people are a little slow to take them up and, and that sort of thing. So so one thing that that we could conceivably do is is basically develop a funding opportunity stimulate people. We might not even have to put any money into it. We might just stimulate them by having them write an application, which is kind of mean. Um, but, but, and, then, and then see at the, time, at the time that they come in and after they're reviewed um, to, to see if, if things really have moved forward, then, then probably this is a solved problem, which would be great. Um, in terms of the YN mitochondrial, and I, I would ask David and others who, who do this kind of genotyping to comment, my understanding is that they are still very problematic in terms of, of genotyping accuracy. And, and what we were looking for was a small amount of money to stimulate analysis of existing data sets. And, and I think the existing data sets probably aren't there yet. I don't know, David, do you want to comment? I agree as far as the Y and the mitochondria. And I wasn't, on the copy number variants, I wasn't sure if you meant copy number variants across the genome or just on the X. No, well, copy number variants across the genome. Um, the concern that, that we'd have there is that that's a very sexy sort of thing right now and that that might swamp out uh, analysis. Of, yeah, I totally uh, agree. Of, uh, Excellent. Plus, we've had some experience in the Geneva Consortium that's really pretty sobering in terms of, of duplicate concordance in these. I mean, it's, it's you know, a half to two-thirds actually replicate. And, and it, when you look at, at mother-child transmission, only about a quarter to a third of them are transmitted where you would expect 50 percent or, or so. Right. So, so we're, not, we're not convinced that the genotyping there is, is quite good enough yet to stimulate. Yeah, I agree? I, I agree with that as well. Mm -hmm. So I'd, I'd be, if, if you want to stimulate some attention to the X. I don't know if I'd have CNVs in that okay. same. Uh, that's very helpful. Sentence. Yeah, we were we really were on the fence on that. So uh, so that's very helpful to, to hear. Mike. Yeah, one thing I was intending to look up, but but didn't was how many SNPs are there on the mitochondrial? How many mitochondrial SNPs and Y chromosome SNPs are there on the standard products? I just I yeah. have to confess I don't know the answer. I think to that. on on Y there's only like 28 or 30 or so. It's a very small number. Um, on mitochondrial it may be a couple hundred, but I, I honestly don't know. Yeah, before making a decision there, it would be important to have some concept of, you know, how large that scope is. And I would totally agree on the CNV. I think that realistically we've already spent a lot of effort on trying to identify and genotype CNVs in the context of GWAS data and, and boy, putting a substantial more money in, into that, I'm not sure is the right thing to do. Matt, this is just, it's too little if you want to take on the CNVs. Right, yeah. And the, the additional problem with mitochondria, of course, is heteroplasmy, and then you see so you have to worry about, um, you know, where your sensitivity is and, and how heteroplasmy affects that. So would, I think that's a murky area right now. Would you recommend not including the mitochondrial in a, in a uh, solicitation or including it but looking at it very skeptically? I mean, allowing people to come in, maybe they have really great approaches for, for using it that we don't know about. Well, it, I, I, I guess I would say, I. Uh, I wouldn't, I don't see a problem including it, but I, I just think the review of that has to be very, uh, a, a very informed review. Great. And it wouldn't, and it wouldn't be the emphasis, the emphasis really on the X. Howard. Well, and I, I would, uh, I, I completely agree with what's been said, except I would maybe emphasize it a little bit more, but review it very hard because part of the reason why the reagents that we currently have available are, are not that great for, for, for Y and for mitochondria is that there hasn't been any expectation around it. Um, and so, uh, if there if there is, there might be some um, informatics person who could turn their energy to it and figure it out, or some of the uh, the companies may uh, may decide they better up their game a bit. But I'm not going to hold my breath on the latter. But you know, it could happen. It could happen. Any other? Yes. I I just make one more comment, and that is, if if one really is thinking of putting this out as a trial balloon, with the intention that a year from now we may decide this isn't a problem and therefore then not funding these grants that people would go to the trouble of putting in, I think that's a terrible choice. Um, I, I think one needs to make the decision, is this something we think is important or not? If we're not sure, it would be a better choice to put this off for a period of time than it would be to put up a trial balloon that I think will get a number of our colleagues pretty upset with us if it goes in that direction. 
Although the funding plan will be about the same as it is now. <laughs> yeah. Fair, fair enough. So we, I think we would propose, given the data, you know, the, the, the best data that we have right now says that this is needed. And I, and I think that's a, a fair uh, thing to go forward with a solicitation. Things can always change. I, I do yeah. think, though, that the situation is a little different. Sometimes you need to stimulate methods when there aren't any methods. And here you already have methods being used in a third of existing studies. And that just strikes me as a, a different level of, of priority than a case where method, methods don't exist at all. So I, I would hope the incentive to find uh, strong associations if they're there would itself be a reason that people would want to apply X chromosome methods to their existing data sets, particularly if they uh, already exist and are working in other studies. So I, again, it's not a large amount of money, but uh, the level of priority here to me seems less than those cases where methods don't yet exist, they're not being included in any studies uh, for, for uh, an important kind of analysis. Yeah, and the, the methods development was sort of a, you know, if needed, but but I would agree with you that would be a low priority for, for this. It's really using the existing data. Sir? Actually, actually something like a, like the genome analysis workshop, one of those types of things focused on this mm -hmm. may get as much out of for nothing mm -hmm. um, as, uh, as putting out an RFA or a PA. Mm -hmm. uh, because it, you, you're right. I mean, I think the problem is not X, because people will analyze that. Y, it sounds like there's not enough SNPs to worry about. Mitochondria, mm -hmm. I don't know. It sounds like there could be some hope there. I would come back to something that Mike suggested, which is actually a, a publication. I mean, you've got these data together, and I, I don't know where the I, – I haven't seen these – any kind of emphasis on these data, and they're really astounding, and particularly if the data are just sitting there that people could do it now. Yeah, so, so that is definitely a plan uh, of ours, and Anastasia was busily working on slides for me, and then we'll, <laughs> we'll take over uh, right now. Uh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> Great. Any additional comments? So, what do we do about uh, approving this as a concept? Do I hear a motion for one approval or disapproval? Well, I'd move disapproval. And is there a second? Second. Is there additional discussion? Do you feel that without this, you can stimulate this to happen? Because it, I mean, David's point is true that is this isn't job one, but you know, there is some work. To do. We, we are trying to stimulate it as best we can within our uh, consortia, and, and there is resistance to it even as that's happened. So getting people to do the imputation on the X chromosome and to, and to do the X chromosome analyses has been a challenge. Um, and, you know, and we're paying them. Uh, in, in other studies, I'm not sure that you know, we have any, any clout. We would like to think that people would see this as, a, as an opportunity and would go forward with it. It hasn't seemed to happen in the past couple of years, and so it seemed as though some stimulation would be appropriate. We can wait another year and see how it goes. Mike? Well, it is actively happening. In type 1 diabetes, it's happening. In type 2 diabetes, it's happening. In glucose and insulin, it's happening. In anthropometrics, it's happening. Uh, in lipids, it's happening. Now, as I say, I don't know what's going on in some of the other areas, but in terms of immunogenetics and in terms of metabolic uh, genetics, it is happening. So. Mike, is it just too soon and we're not seeing the publications? Correct. Okay. Correct. So no, these, the, the not current, that we're not finding current, anything. No, the current round of meta-analyses going on are 1,000 genome space. So there's a whole new round of meta-analyses going on for all of these different consortia I just named. They're doing, we're doing it again because we've got a different set to impute against. We're can impute against a much larger set of markers than we could when we were doing this based on HapMap. So we will have publications coming out, I hope, from all of these different efforts. Um, all of them are including the X, and I wasn't sure about that. So that's that's a polling I actually did when I first saw the the, the clearance to see that um, or the proposed clearance to see what was going on. And in fact, I got emails back on Friday from each of those different groups I mentioned that yes, we are actively doing that. I thought so, but I wasn't sure. But I did check. So, Mike, would you would you have concerns about the phenotypes that really don't lend themselves to these large meta analyses? I mean, you've you've described traits that are you know have hundreds of thousands of people. And, and, and that's the place where I think there is an argument for doing this, 
but I think there's also an argument for, for writing the short position paper. And I, I think either oh, approach is reasonable. I think either approach is reasonable. I, I've got to believe it's going to happen, but I could be wrong about that. There is a, I, I can speak a little bit for neuropsychiatric disease. There is a sort of a growing uh, interest and in, uh, realization that one needs to take into account uh, sex differences in incidence and that we have not, uh, that many papers pay almost no attention to that. And so I think you're going to see more interest in that and maybe that will stimulate people to look at the uh, extant data. So, so can I ask a question before we go, because obviously there's, an, there's a motion on the floor in the negative direction, so I don't, I, before we vote on that, well, I, I guess what I want to hear from those who are uh, moving not to move forward on this, what your proposal might be for sort of reassessing. I mean, there's obviously all of us right or right or wrong, right? And so either this is going to have an uptick or it's not. Are you, in, in saying don't go forward with this consequence at this time, are you saying come back in four months, eight months, 12 months? That's sort of the windows that we operate in. Yeah. I think I think four months is probably too soon because these papers are just getting started. Uh, I think eight months would be quite reasonable. Um, or as I said, you know, this is not a lot of money. One could just say, you know, this is important enough to us that, that we think we ought to commit the funding to it. Um, but 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 that would be the time range I would be thinking. I think four months would be too soon to know. I think eight months we'd have a good idea. Isn't this a question not so much of is it going to happen or is it not going to happen without this funding, uh, but rather more a question of uh, can it be significantly accelerated and uh, just what the benefit of that is relative to the, the amount of money that's being spent? I, ju I just asked Terry the question whether this is something that could be addressed by issuing a program announcement which is essentially a statement of institute's interest. It doesn't carry any commitment to funds with it, but if you get good applications, you can fund them. They're essentially equivalent to investigator-initiated R01s. I think that'd be totally sensible. Okay, any other discussion? So with that discussion, we have a motion on the floor in a second. Uh, all in favor of the motion not to uh, approve this as a concept for an RFA, uh, please indicate. Opposed? OK. Thank you. So we will go ahead and look at these other. No. So we'll go ahead and, and look at these other approaches to uh, to trying to achieve this goal. Uh, 